all my life, I just took it for granted. There was an Adam and Eve. Noah's flood really happened. I believe every word in this book right here. I knew it was true. And while I still believe in Jesus Christ, I have come to this, to, uh, to this grant of realizing there was no Moses, at least not the way this was written. Noah, uh, Adam and Eve were not original stories, but they were plagiarized from earlier, plagiarized and built upon on earlier or ancient Sumerian myths. Come on, God, is this the best you can do? I remember one time reading about the ancient ninja. I read a sentence where a ninja could scream at an opponent and the, uh, uh, the opponent would drop dead. This perplexed me. How does this happen? So I asked Mark Brinkley. He was all into that sh sh stuff and sci-fi and Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, how does that happen? How does, a, how does a ninja kill an opponent by just screaming at him? And he says, those are, those are probably lies told to make him seem more powerful than they really are. Makes sense. Well, how the fuck, since they've proven there is no Moses, how the fuck do you know that the same hasn't happened with the Jewish people? Turn with me. Let me find it and Google Shamgar. Judges 331. I'm just going to read it on the computer. I hate, hate, I hate the rare of these glasses. Okay. Here it goes. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he too saved Israel. Killed 600 Philistines in a battle. Is that true? Or was that an embellishment to make him seem more powerful than he really was to make God more believable. Jehovah more believable. How about this one? How about this story? After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, Ahohite, one of the three mighty men of David. And they defied the Philistines that would gather together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. So basically, he killed all those people. Single-handedly with one sword. Here's another one. People who Single-handed. How, single, how, how about uh, Samson with the jawbone bone of an ass defeated a whole army of Philistines? Is this even physically possible? I'd like to see Mythbusters 
do an episode on if it was possible, how it would be possible for one man, one sword, to take on a whole bunch of warriors, a whole platoon, whatever, and beat them all, and kill them all. How was Shamgar able, with an ox goad, to kill 600 Philistines on the battlefield? Are these true stories, or like the ninja embellishments? Like the ninja can yell at an opponent, and the opponent dies. Are they true stories, or are they lies? Fabrications, embellishments, to make their god, and their way of life, and their heritage, Jews, seem more powerful than the rest of humanity. I want to fucking know. The moral of the story is this. I feel God has lied to me. I still believe in Jesus. I got to believe in Jesus. I'll get into that later. I'll give it uh, I'll get into it later later. But you know, I, just, I there's a neat deep inner need to believe in Jesus. No other religion can inspire this need. I've looked at all the re other religions. I've read them, although they're inspiring, none of them can produce the feeling the need in me for Jesus that Jesus can. So Jesus has to be real. It's not just me, it's universal. People hear the message of Jesus and the message of Christianity and Jesus fill a bias, fill a void that no other religion in the world on the planet can do so. Jesus meets a universal need no other religion can do. Now why is that if Jesus is not real? But if Jesus is real, why is it? That there is no Moses, no Adam and Eve. Well, are there, I believe, now let's get this straight. I still believe those stories are the Word of God. But I'm thinking there, like C.S. Lewis. Lewis. C.S. Lewis did not believe Moses and and Adam and Eve were real. He believed there were myths, true myths. He called them. But by the time of David and his court. They became true stories until the absolute truth of Jesus Christ came into the world. And he was born of the virgin, sinless, never seen a day in his life, died and rose for the dead. But all the events leading up, but if that be so, if there is no Moses and Moses and Elijah, who did Jesus meet in the mountain transfiguration? Unless it was the, the, the disciples who named him, those two, as Moses and Elijah. Jesus never said it was, it was Moses and Elijah. Maybe, Mo, maybe Moses and Elijah are personifications. And certain men fulfill the role of this persona. That's the only thing I can keep believing in to keep myself being eaten up from doubts about Jesus Christ. There's something in me I got to believe in Jesus. If I do not believe in Jesus, the anxiety, the terror, the fear. It's like a bird knows how knows instinctively to fly south. I just know, I just I better believe in Jesus. If I stop believing in Jesus, danger, 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 and inner intuition tells me danger, 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 danger. You better believe in Jesus. You better believe in Jesus. But it does so lovingly. And even if I if in even if I wanted to stop believing in Jesus, there's no way in hell I could. Let's come with me to this man right here. Jerry okay, let me tell you some stories first. Okay. This is not the only man that has told two stories about, uh, like these. Where people either refused to get saved. The preacher pled with them to get saved. And the people refused. They resisted an inner compulsion 
to turn to Jesus. That's a, that the message of Jesus as a universal pressuring. The, no matter where you go in the world, when you hear the message of Jesus, it creates in, in the listener, listener an inner compulsion, an urge to turn to Jesus. And that if you, until you do danger, 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 danger. Look, no other religion does this. Not Hinduism, not Mormonism, not Voodoo, not Jainism. No other religion does this. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this man has told stories. A first hound accounts he's seen firsthand. A people who resisted the inner compulsion to turn to Jesus when they heard the message of Jesus. And they died in mysterious ways. Too many to be just coincidences. And I will give a thousand dollars to a. a oh, uh, no, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. No man has ever been killed for refusing to become a Mormon. No man has ever been killed by coincidence or freakish accidents or God. For refusing to become a Mormon, for refusing to become a Hindu, for refusing to believe in the Voodoo gods, not even the Voodoo, not even Voodoo deaths and Voodoo deaths have been documented. Death by Voodoo curses has been documented. There, Voodoo deaths do not even have the power of the God of Christianity who kills people like this. I'm delighted that God gave. And I challenge, I challenge R and Ra and Matt Little Honey and those eminent atheists who know everything to debunk these stories because, look, as long as these stories are true, I'm, I'm going to keep believing in Jesus. And don't you dare do what Jimmy Queer Snow did on his broadcast. He's like, those stories never happen. Oh, well, guess what, Matt Little Honey, bitch? You never were a true Christian because true Christians don't need convert. How does it feel, bitch? You're doing the same. Jimmy Snow is doing the same thing to me that I'm doing to you, bitch. What? Are my stories too. Do, do my stories trouble you? Make you wet money? Maybe there is a God. Because these stories that you're about to hear, I'll give $1,000 to anyone who can show me whether these, one of these stories has. Happened to a person who refused to convert to Islam, a person who, or uh, Mormonism, or Voodoo, or Hinduism, or a person who mocked one of these religions and was killed coincidentally like this. I will give a thousand dollars to the person who can show me a story that matches one of these stories where Christianity killed a person for either mocking God or not getting saved gave me the honor of being here today on the 34th and a let me find Alex Connecting Revival meeting in Taylor, South Carolina. Two young men drove up on a motorcycle riding piggyback. One of the deacons had invited them, or one of the laymen had invited them into the church. They cursed Brother Harrison, one of the greatest preachers that I ever knew in my life. And they said some horrible and terrible things about the church. And about this deacon that invited them, a layman that, in, that invited them to come into the service. They cursed and swore. And one of them said, while you're in there listening to that jackass Bray, we'll be in Spartanburg, South Carolina, watching a vaudeville. They kicked on the motorcycle. They went down just from the church about 100 yards and started into what was called the the Cheek Springs Curve, about a half a mile uphill curve. At the <coughs> inquest, the driver that was driving his car up the hill said, I noticed a car or a motorcycle coming along with the side of my car out of the corner of my eye. He said, at first I thought it was a traffic officer. And he said, I looked at my speedometer and I was going about 60 miles an hour. The man that was coming down the hill and around the curve, he said, I saw the oncoming car, but I did not see the motorcycle until I was about a hundred feet away. And all of a sudden, they came out from behind the car with these two men on on the on the on the bike. 
And he said before I'd even touched the brakes, they had hit me head on. And they said, how fast were you going? And he said between 60 and 65 miles an hour. So those two boys hit that oncoming car with a combined speed of at least 120 miles an hour. The boy that was riding on the front of the motorcycle went up and over the car and struck his head on the right side of his head, shaving off half of his head right on the pavement. The boy that was riding piggyback went into the oncoming car, and if you've ever taken a piece of meat and run it through a food grinder, you know how it rolls out through those little grooves, all the way down to his shoulder, this part of his head, and down to here, went through that radiator, and back on that hot engine. In less than two minutes, from the time they were cursing God, both of them were in hell. I was holding a revival meeting in Louisiana in one of the big rodeo arenas. God was giving us a great revival. We came to the last service of that meeting, and I was preaching the sermon that I'm preaching tonight. When I gave the invitation, over 400 people walked down the aisle and made a profession of faith. Up in the right side of that stadium, on the last row of seats, three businessmen mocked all the time I preached. And when we gave the invitation, I can still hear them saying, there goes your poker buddy. There goes your girlfriend. I can still hear them say, we'll have them back as soon as this evangelist leaves town. They cursed the meeting. They mocked at the work of the Holy Spirit. When the, I had finished giving the invitation, I said, I don't know who you three gentlemen are, but I said, I want to tell you and give you a message from God. All three of you have stepped over God's deadline, and God signed your death warrant. They laughed me to scorn. That was about 10.30 Sunday evening. At 6 o'clock the next morning, one of those businessmen put the key in the door of his business to unlock the door and drop dead in the street. About 11 o'clock that day, the second businessman started to cross the street to a restaurant to have lunch and fell dead in the middle of the street. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, the third one was sitting with his secretary in his office, and he said, my two buddies are in hell, and you see that sun pointing out the window. He said, before it goes down tonight, I'll join them in hell, and pitched out of that seat. Dead and in hell. Okay. Not before, he did not believe in Jesus. But after mocking God and Jesus. He knew deep within his spirit. He knew in, by intuition. He looked at that sun. He felt an inner, inner compulsion. Before that sun sets, no, he said, my two buddies are dead and in the hell. Before that sun sets outside, I'll join them. Now, if Jesus isn't real, R and raw, how the hell do you explain that? I don't like the thought any of anybody burning in hell forever and ever, but you know I have no choice to but to believe it. Something like this is never. I'll give you a thousand. I'll, I'll say I'll give you a thousand dollars if anybody can find a story like this that happened in Mormonism, Hinduism, even Voodoo, or Islam. Because there, there, I there is not a story like that. Not that nothing like that is ever, ever, ever. Ever, I bet my life on it ever happened in any other religion but Christianity. Back in the days of the revivals, when the Holy Spirit was at work. Of course, it won't happen today because God's written Ichabod, Ichabod over the country of America, and they, God, not in the Christian church today. Why the fuck do you think that all those? Christians of the day, eminent Christians, got the Trump prophets wrong because God's not present today. But he was back then. And he 
And don't don't do like Matt Little Honey. Matt the, Matt Little Honey and Iron Raw, you can curse the Holy Ghost all all you want and not die. Because it's called divine hiddenness. God just God does just enough, gives just enough scant evidence to give you the opportunity to ch to be able to choose to believe in him of your free will without being coerced or to not. He's a gentle God. He gently persuades you. He does not force you to believe in him. That goes against his nature. He gives just enough scant evidence that you have an inner compulsion to believe in him. And if you follow that inner if you listen to that inner urgent compulsion, which no other religion produces to do to it, then you will be saved. No that no other religion Produces that gentle, silent urging to convert their Mormonism or Hinduism or Islam or Hind or doo doo. Only true Christianity does this. Jesus has to be real. I believe in Jesus. But then again, no, no, not. But then, how do you explain that fact that there was no Moses, there was no Adam and Eve? I just got to keep believing in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Just trust and keep believing and trusting in Jesus. Clawing and scratching to keep from falling away from him because you can't go wrong if you believe in Jesus. And yet, also, from my heart, I curse God for these stories of Adam and Eve not being true. God lied to us. God lied to me. God lied to us. It was so easy back in the days when you can just believe every story in this Bible was the complete truth. So much, It was so easy. But I have an inner compulsion to believe in Jesus. And coupled with these stories that happened, there's no way you're going to get me to deconvert. No way in hell, R and Raw. Especially since... Since you run from these stories, you run from these stories because these stories scare you. You're too, you're too afraid to tackle these stories. R and Raw, you know everything about a topic of atheism so small, but you don't know beans about other topics, all the other topics this small. And if you pile all the topics upon one another, there'd be this much, and you know everything about this much. What's to be known of this much? And Jimmy Snow, those stories never happen. Look, this is a man of God. He believes in Revelations, which says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So, so he's not going to tell a lie just to promote his Christianity. No, sorry, they didn't do that back then. They were godly men. They're not, they were not the Joel Osteens and Sid Ross and Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland's. They were godly men. They were they they were men who would have died rather than deny Jesus. And yet and here's another thing that's got a, got me angry at God to the point of crushing him. Turn with me in your Bible to the Sermon on the Mount. To the Lord's Prayer. And this is something my pastor in my church named Greg Thompson. No, Greg, Kin, Greg Kincaid at New Baptist Church in Kiss, North Carolina, told me. Turn with me to the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, starting verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the tower, and the glory forever. Amen. Great King K told me that a letter scribe was so overwhelmed with glory that he added the words 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. That was not in the original or the best manuscript of Matthew. So that was added. Now I curse God for this because all my life I've believed that Jesus said that. And, not, and to find out I believe the lie all this time, Jesus did not say that. That makes the Lord's Prayer less inspired to me. Inspired to me. It's still inspired to me, inspiring to me, but you know, not having those lines just kills it. A, a later scribe added these, and Greg Kincaid was talking about this scribe glowingly. You know what I think? I curse the scribe who did this. I curse the scribe. I curse the scribe. I wish I could go back in time and kick him in the balls. I curse the scribe in the name of God. Turn with me in Proverbs. It Proverbs it says, Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and I be found out a liar. In Revelations, the book, it says about the book of Revelations, Whosoever addeth anything to this, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Whosoever shall take away from this book, God shall take away his part in the tree of life. In the book. So this scribe, Sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intentions. If this scribe, if scribes pilfered with the word of God like this, how in the fuck do I know I can trust what I read in this Bible? That men didn't add and edit this to suit their needs. I'm told that Jesus, there's a dilemma. They either Jesus never said, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. Or either scribes deleted this. They can't. The general consensus is that they can't figure out which one. Did Jesus say, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do"? Is this Bible the Holy Bible? Is it, or is it a Bible full of holes? I curse God for this. I curse God for not keeping His word pure. I cur I believe in Jesus, but I curse God. And because, uh, and this adds fuel to me. I curse God if I'm not a good looking guy. I curse God if he does not love me. I curse God if I do not get my hair back. I curse God if I do not, I not have the long forms. I curse God if I do not look in my 20s. I'm not, I'm so unhappy, miserable. What, uh, what else do I have to do but curse God? I don't give a fuck. If I'm not happy, let him punish me. Let him judge me. Let me stand under his wrath. Just let him save me in the end. Let me get by by my skin of my freaking teeth. Since I can't. Is this the Holy Bible or is this, is, or this a Bible full of holes? Is Jesus really real? I believe. I got to believe in Jesus. I just got to. But folks. Something's fucked up. I would, why couldn't they, why could not have them Christian scribes be like the Jewish scribes when they wrote their holy scriptures? The Jews, when writing the Old Testament, if they made one mistake, one wrong pen stroke, they tore the whole document up and started over. Why in the fuck couldn't the Christian scribes have been like this? I curse the scribe. I don't care how inspired he felt. I curse, I curse the scribe in the name of the scriptures. For adding to the word of God. I hope he I hope he loses his salvation for that and goes to hell forever and ever. Because it's people like him that makes that kill the souls of those of those who us who do believe when you find out what that what we believe was a goddamn lie. Or a half truth. Man, if Jesus did not say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do, I'm so fucking underwhelmed with God and Jesus. That has to be true. And people reading that, oh, there's another thing. Jesus sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane was not in the original manuscripts of Luke. It was added by little scribes to prove that Jesus was human, like us. And yet people, I know this one woman, a video, she, after reading 
about Jesus sweating blood in the garden. The Holy Spirit used that to turn into to make it make it so she was able to get saved. How is it the whole how is it that the Holy Ghost can use the lie to make you believe in Jesus? I thought the Bible the Bible says in first John that no lie is of the truth. So I curse God for this. I curse God. I curse God. I believe in Jesus, but I curse God. God, this is not your shining hour. People didn't people Christians giving false prophecies in your name and you just sit back on that throne and twiddle their thumb and don't judge them. John Calvin preaching Calvinism and murdering his opponents and you just bless them and give them your spirit to preach the gospel. When Jesus said, if you have ought to get your brother, go and be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer a gift. Well, if Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you will lose the forgiveness that you have from God. And Paul inverses his gospel and says, forgive, forgiving, other, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Did, forget, did, the, principle, did the principle of forgiveness change? From the kingdom age when Jesus was teaching it to the age of grace when Paul started teaching. Is it Christianity or was supposed to follow, follow or polyanity? I'm so underwhelmed. I expect Jesus to be our leader, not Paul. You know, bring him. I was listening to Dr. Bruce Phillips and Don Holland talking about. Mormonism. They said Joseph Smith did not really found Mormonism. He just taught a bunch of stuff and it was Brigham Young that got Mormonism on its feet. Had it not been for Paul the Apostle, Christianity would have floundered. So Jesus, are you really real? Or not? Because Jesus, if you're not real, we need to dethrone you. But if you're real, we need to worship you and praise you. But I, you got to show me that you're real. And until you do, I curse the throne that God sits on.